What's up, everybody? Welcome to ASRI of the Arizona Real Estate Investors Association. And today, this is not another Lunch and Learn, where every week we bring in a new uh, guest that is either a real estate investor or provides a service to real estate investors to make our lives better, easier, and more profitable. So um, here we are, Wednesday, 12 p.m. We do this every week. Um, as Rhea's purpose is to unlock and accelerate our members' ability to invest in real estate through education, market information, support, and networking opportunities so they can e elevate their financial well-being. So if you like that, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube. We're everywhere. So wherever you like to consume information, check us out. I usually just take a few minutes uh, just to kind of let you know what's going on around Azria and our calendar of events. So I'll just take a couple minutes of your time, and then we are going to bring on our special guest, Unbridled Wealth, uh, to talk about infinite banking concepts. So Azria Phoenix Monthly Meeting is on the second Monday of every month. This month, it's on February 13th. It's That's the only meeting. Our big meeting happens at Venue 8600 in North Scottsdale. Um, we definitely are going to hit the market update, uh, market news. We do our association update and uh, um, obviously the trade show with all our business associates. And there, uh, our education for the evening will be flipping in a changing market with Tracy Royce. She's an excellent fix and flipper, a local here in Phoenix. She's great at what she does. So you definitely want to hear what she has to say on the 13th. Then we go down to Tucson and do the same show. Um, Tracy will be with us as well in Tucson on February 14th. And then on Tuesday, January 21st, 4th, the fourth Tuesday of every month, we always do the Phoenix Real Estate Club. The Phoenix Real Estate Club is uh, just as old as Ezria. Um, Alan Langston started that about 20 years ago. Uh, it's very uh, um, exciting to be there. There's always experienced investors. We do the have and want session where you get the opportunity to stand up and let the entire group know exactly what kind of uh, you know needs you have for your real estate business, what you want for your business, what properties you have for sale, what services you provide to real estate investors. We do a lot of power networking and uh, market discussion. And most importantly, I love the deal sharing uh, time where we investors go around the room and let everybody know what kind of deals they're doing in today's market. It opens up your eyes to kind of see uh, what can be done and what's being done uh, in our current market. So that's uh, Tuesday, January 24th. Uh, here at the Central Phoenix office. Uh, then our subgroups, we have about 12 to 14 of them running all month long, uh, all throughout the state of Arizona. Um, as you can see, depending what strategy you're interested in, or if you're newer and you're trying to figure out which strategy you would like to be a part of, uh, we have a group for it. So from notes to fix and flip to buy and hold, the cash flow 101 board game, the women's group. Um, tonight, we actually have the Experienced Investors Group, which is at the Hidden Track uh, Wine uh, Shop down the street on 12th Street in Highland. So a group of us get together and just chat about real estate. And then in the office, um, we, we do the call-a-thon. So if you're interested in calling homeowners and uh, practicing getting that skill set built, uh, we'll have Paul Michaela here uh, from 4 to 7 at the office tonight. So for all meetings, all events, always go to ezria.org forward slash calendar. And also, when you're on the website checking out the calendar, head over to the top right-hand corner into the forums. We have multiple topics and um, discussions you can take part in um, and ask questions with other ESRIA members and Arizona investors. We also added a property posting section. So if you have a property for sale or if you're looking to buy an off-market property, uh, you can you know search in our property posting section. Um, we are actually already had quite a few members uh, do deals with each other in the property posting section. So it's it's a great um, resource. Launchpad group sessions coming up Saturday, Saturday, January 28th here in the Phoenix office. $30 for members, $100 for non-members. We want to help you create your business plan, right? So when you're getting started in real estate, um, you can easily spend the first year, you know, trying to figure out where to go, chasing the shiny object syndrome going on YouTube, seeing what's hot, what's what's the next thing to do. It's it's all enticing and it all works, but you need a target, right? Can't get it, can't move forward if you don't have a target to, that you're aiming at. So we're going to take these eight objectives and help you clearly define those uh, in the four-hour class. So this way here, we, our goal is to have you, you know, like I said, to have a goal, gain momentum and um, within your business so you can start getting your, you know, get your first deal done. Uh, so once again, Saturday, 20. January 28th for that class. 
And back to Tracy, uh, Fix and Flip Training and Bus Tour. So Tracy be, will be with us Monday and Tuesday, Phoenix and Tucson. And then uh, she's going to be hosting our bus tour that Saturday, February 18th from 8 to 5. So how it's going to work is we're about, we'll have about four to five properties um, that we'll, we'll go on site and see. Um, with Tracy. She's going to walk you through those properties as if she was a general contractor. She's going to show you how she looks at a deal, what she would do to it. And just, everyone will have a little checklist as, and, you know, so you can get an idea of what you would do to the property. Then we're going to come back. We're going to provide lunch after the tour. That'll go from like nine to 12. We'll do lunch from 12 to one. Then from about one to five, uh, we'll do a learning, right? We'll walk through those properties um, here in the central Phoenix office. We'll comp them out. We'll, everyone will share notes. Tracy will let us know what she's going to do to those properties. Um, so it's a great learning, a great way to learn from Tracy. And actually, um, what I forgot to mention, on Monday and Tuesday and on Saturday, um, Home Depot is actually helping sponsor the event. So they wanted to help out in, uh, our fix and flippers here in the community. So um, actually, a representative from Atlanta is flying out here just to be a part of the event. So we're going to have a bunch of swag and giveaways from Home Depot um, as well. So and our net worth realty will be sponsoring the lunch. Uh, so check us out February 18th. Uh, we did it last July with two weeks notice in the middle of the summer and we sold out 40 seats in less than two weeks. So we already got about 30 people signed up. So it's about one bus gone already. So I, I think we might just stick to two buses. So um, definitely pre-register uh, as soon as you can. And then most importantly, with our special guest today, which we're going to be breaking down, real estate without the bank, leave your lender and invest like the wealthy with unbridled wealth. So um, they're coming Friday and Saturday, which we have to add. It is on our calendar. Jack, I know you're on here. So just you guys will be Friday night. You guys are going to be in Tucson. Correct. Uh, yeah. What time in Tucson? 5.30 to 8.30. Um, it's at a co-working space on Country Club that Greg Gibson is opening up to us. Awesome. Uh, man. Great yeah, guy. so that's for the Tucson community. Cool. So um, we'll have you talk a little bit more about that later uh, Later on. Um, all details are on our calendar about the Tucson event. And then uh, next morning, Unbridled Wealth will be here at the Central Phoenix office with us from 10 to 2, uh, talking about um, investing without the bank. Obviously, we're going to learn more about that right now. So we'll, we'll break that down. Um, as Rhea's show, uh, we've been going on about man, over 60 episodes now. So all podcast platforms and YouTube, check us out. Um, if you're new to Ezria, Home Depot, we have the, the largest discount and um, benefit program in the country. So if you don't have your Home Depot Pro account connected to your Ezria membership, you must do that. You get 2% uh, cash back in all purchases, 20% off all your liquids. It's a huge savings if you're uh, flipping houses and you're doing turns on your rentals or just shopping at Home Depot at any time. So take advantage of that. And check out Patrick Allen's new book. This is our first book published by Azria. Patrick Allen is a subgroup leader in Tucson. He does the Beginners Tucson Investors Group. Um, he's a specialist at house hacking. That's what he does. He lives it. He breathes it. So he wrote a book about it and why you should do it. So uh, you can buy, find this on Amazon, uh, digital or print. Um, it's 99 cents for the digital, 9.99 for the print. Very affordable. Leave us a five-star review. We'll love it. We'll love you for that. Really uh, would appreciate any support. Let us know. Give us your feedback on the book. Um, yeah, check that out. We're really excited. If you want to become a member, we have two programs, $125 for uh, the year. As a basic member, where if you're going to go to less than 10 events a year, I suggest the 125 membership. If you're going to be highly active, I suggest a 249, and that is per year, and both programs have access to all benefits and discounts from Home Depot and all our business associates. All right. Thank you for hearing me out on all that. It's a mouthful. <laughs> so uh, here we are, Real Estate Without the Bank with Olivia McGraw, here to talk to us and show us how to become wealthy. So, Olivia. Hello. Let me stop my Thank share. Thank you so much for having us today. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Um, awesome. All right. Yeah. So you have capability to share the screen. You've got the tool. I do. Yes. Yeah. You got your exactly. partner Jack online to help out. So um, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram. Leave your questions in the comments. Molly and I will get to those questions and get them so we can get them answered. Um, this is networking. I know we're online. So put your 
your camera on. I would love it. See, see the face yeah. with the name. Um, but I'm going to let you take over from here. And I might pop okay. in with some questions myself. Great. Well, how many of you would like to know how to think like the wealthy? Raise your hands. Yep. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, so that's really where our conversation is going to start today. And um, what my goal is, is just to introduce some questions and some things that we need to be thinking about and really um, being curious about. And so in order to expand what we um, what we already know and being able to embrace some new ideas that the wealthy are actually the wealthiest families in our country are already practicing and implementing. But um, in order to do that, they are not following things that you and I have been taught to do with our money. And so uh, full disclosure today is um, undeniably a teaser because we want you all to come in person to our event. And so, uh, but again, like today, my main goal is just to kind of raise some questions to challenge some of the stuff that we've been taught and, and not saying that it's not true, but it's not the full truth, if that makes sense. So if, as we go along, if you all have questions or want Jack and I to kind of dive further into something, please go ahead and pop it into the uh, into the chat. And I know Molly is our expert manager on this. And so she will either let you all come on and like ask it live in person or type it out and we will answer it. So um, let's see here. <clears throat> just getting everything set up to share my screen. Why did I just lose the thing to say share my screen? Oh my goodness. All the things are happening when you go live. You know, you practice this stuff okay. and then <laughs> I know I'm like, there's the share the screen, the bright green button. Awesome. Okay. So, um, yes, of course, we are Unbridled Wealth, um, and we will be talking today about some tax and legal information, but full disclosure, we are not CPAs and we are not lawyers. So we have amazing people to refer if you are looking for someone like that, but what we will go into is going to touch on some of this stuff. Uh, so um, when I really started to evaluate <clears throat> why I love what I do, and why I love teaching people um, part of what my husband and I are implementing ourselves, I realized that I, uh, at the core of it, that I really believe that our greatest opportunities are outside the box. And so, I mean, yes, that's a giant vague uh, phrase right in that, but it does beg some, some questions. And so number one question is, what is the box? And number two is, who is outside of that box? So um, kind of in reverse order, I really believe that those that are outside the box and the ones that are willing to expand their thinking and to break the rules more or less are the innovators, the entrepreneurs, and the real estate investors, you guys. Um, and by and large, you know, I've been in this industry for, I'm on my fifth year now, four complete years. And these are the folks that actually understand this concept and these principles the most and are willing to explore what ap applying them to their specific situation would actually look like. Um, those that are just want to follow the traditional ways of thinking, um, this isn't for them. And that's fine. And that's great. What they are doing is going to work for them. But if you are having this conversation and listening to us today, I think that you're one of those people that wants to explore opportunities that aren't within the realm of what we've been told. So what are some of those things we've been told? <clears throat> First of all, one penny does one thing. So how many of you are familiar with like the envelope system? Or, uh, you know, it's like you, if you want to save for retirement, there's one way to do that. You got to put it into your, your retirement account. You, $1 um, used to buy you <laughs> so many eggs. Now $1 doesn't seem, seem to buy us as many eggs anymore. Um, if you, if you want to buy in real estate, you better save up for your down payment. Um, so just kind of siphoning off your money to all these different areas. You, uh, you are a good upstanding citizen. Just pay your taxes. Just pay Uncle Sam what he is due. And I'm not saying don't pay your taxes. That is not what I'm saying today. I'm just challenging um, the rules of the tax game. Um, we're told, you know, if you want to progress in life, just go get a traditional American education. Pay your penance, go through college, lock yourself into a long-term low interest loan with the government to pay that thing off. And, um, and then learn some things and then go out in the real world and try and apply them. Um, and I think as every, many of us are learning that the value of that education we've received isn't getting us as far as it used to. Um, it may not even be as worth as much as we're paying for it. 
Uh, and we're also told, you know, invest in the stock market. Um, I'm doing some other continued ag right now. And it is saying, you know, if you want to outpace inflation, the only way to do that is through the stock market. Now, you and I know as real estate investors that um, that isn't necessarily true and that real estate outpaces the stock market. And so um, it's just one of those things of like, this is what the traditional wisdom of wealth is saying. And we're going to challenge some of that wisdom today. So all of this is just that we have more to learn. Um, I am one of those like, yep, tossing the diploma or the um, mortarboard in the in the air. I'm highly educated um, and probably overeducated and don't use very much at all of what I received those, that education in. Um, the things that are actually applying to me and the things that are, are useful to me today are not things that I got through a traditional education system. Um, so part of the problem is that we are taught that our best opportunities and our best options evolve placing our finances into the control of someone else. So this really is something that's at the core of, of that issue. Um, and what happens when we're giving that control to someone else? Well, um, all of the systems in our country are really designed to take the money out of our hand our hard-earned dollars out of our hand and to do something else with it. Because why? Well, they can do something better with it themselves. All right. So um, one paycheck, you know, you go to your W-2 job, you get one paycheck, and we're going to divide that up into a few different ways. So that paycheck is going to do a few things for us. First of all, if you want to save for retirement, we are going to defer our taxes and stick it into a 401k, and we will manage that money for you and make it grow, except for when we don't but you still need to pay us whether or not we do with your money what we said we would, which was make it grow. And so, you know, the stock market drops, your retirement savings plummets, um, but don't worry, just leave it there. It's going to grow back. And every time it grows, guess what? You pay for it again. And again, this is just where we want to challenge some of that thinking. Um, and your money is inaccessible in that regard until age 59 and a half. And if you want to touch that money, well, that's fine. You can borrow from it, but we're going to slap a penalty on it if you need to withdraw. And I think it's, it's correct me if I'm wrong, Jack, I'm pretty sure that it's 80% of those that need to borrow from their retirement accounts, which most Americans do. 80% end up needing to turn that into a withdrawal because they can't pay it back. And with that withdrawal comes 10% uh, penalty. 10% uh, fee on that, plus ordinary income taxes added on top of it. And so um, that's a big penalty to be paying to use your money. Um, but again, like just challenging some of the education behind it. Our traditional education doesn't teach us what to do with that money. Or if you want to know what to do with it, you have to go specialize it and then get a whole bunch of licenses to learn how to manage somebody else's money but then not really get in trouble if you must mismanage it necessarily. So anyway, just raising questions today, not providing all the solutions. Um, <clears throat> so next portion of this, and again, I am not saying don't pay your taxes. I, you know, I'm a, we have to do it. I, I like to drive on paved roads personally. Um, I like having our roads plowed. I'm, I'm based out of Colorado. So we have a big snowstorm right now. And yes, I'm very grateful that, you know, what I pay my government that takes care of some things. But um, you know, paying those taxes and I'm on a system where I have to pay taxes quarterly as well. And it's not always the best idea. You know, sometimes is it better to actually pay some of those penalties to hold on to your money a little bit longer? Um, and I don't know if you all have ever talked or thought about this and the fact that everybody celebrates, yay, April 20th, we get our money back, um, the tax return day. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, everyone celebrates, it's like free money that we get back, but we've actually just given our government a no interest loan that they're returning to us without in, in, with interest. Is that is that a deal that we would make with anyone else? Let me borrow some money from you. I'm going to do a bunch of things with it, by the way, while I'm holding on to it, but then I'm going to give it back to you and just, just what you deserve to have back, not all of it. So again, just raising some questions. I also heard, um, Somebody say one time that taxes are actually a game <clears throat> and uh, said, tell me this isn't a game. The government knows how much you owe. You don't know how much you owe. You have to guess. And if you get, get it wrong, you go to jail. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've never heard somebody explain it that way, but it's true. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a dangerous game, but th that if it is a game, it does mean that there are rules. And if you know the rules and you know how to play by the rules, then you can win. 
And so it's just just playing the game. And again, this these are things that the wealthy really know how to do well. And we tend to criticize them for it, for playing the game by the rules. And then we're all mad when they're not paying their taxes. I was like, no, they're paying their taxes. They just know what the opportunities are within those rules and how to play it well. Um, so I know that you all have the cash flow game. I haven't actually played it myself, but I know um, Monopoly has a bunch of hidden lessons inside of it and just learning how to steward it and to win the game. But life really, I mean, yes, there's greater stakes um, out there when we're playing some of those real life games, but um, the end result is kind of the same. Whoever has the most at the end and passes it on wins. Well, yeah, there's different thinking on that too. So, um, all right, so let's just move on here. So another way thing that we're taught is uh, the necessary evil. And I call them the necessary evil because um, our world has become increasingly difficult to operate without them. Um, and part of this is just like, hey, you know what? You get that paycheck. Let's go ahead and just drop that right into your bank account. You don't even have to go to the bank. It just will um, automatically flow into your bank account. And then uh, when you need it back, you can just get it back out. And so all of this is the control of actually those dollars and holding on to them longer. And Jack and Jason and I see money transferred quite often. And it's fascinating and frustrating to see how long a bank, if a loan from for a client is coming into their bank account, the bank will actually hold on to that money for two or three days before they deposit it into the client's bank account. And so we have to have them call up and we're like, hey, tell your bank you are expecting this and you're expecting it to be in your bank account because they're the ones causing the holdup here, not anyone else in this chain of command. Um, and so again, that's part, part of the reason they wanna hold on to it is that they are doing big things with your money while it is in transit. And so um, it just kind of to peel, peel back a layer of the surface and to explore what's actually going on with that money while you don't have access to it. Uh, one thing that I've just uh, learned along this journey personally is that I never realized that when I actually put my money into my bank account, I don't legally own it anymore. I am more or less loaning my money to the bank. And every, I mean, it's nice and, uh, 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 makes us feel secure to think that our bank, our money is actually locked up in a vault way in the back. But actually, um, while our money is in the bank, it's being loaned out more times than it actually exists, which is kind of a mind tripper. Um, it's something called fractional lending. And Jack, I don't know if you want to chime in and, and explain that one for a second, but um, that might be kind of a helpful anecdote of just uh, what's actually happening to our money when we deposit it into our savings account. Uh, yeah, when we deposit money with the bank, they're only required to keep percent of all their on hand reserve and to loan out the rest of it. Um, and when you think about the rates at play, you're getting maybe between 0.1 and 1% on your deposits and banks are loaning those dollars at 5 to 25%. And because it's not their money, it's our money the return on investment for them to pay a dollar to make five is 500 percent so this is really what we're moving towards like what would it look like to recapture the banking function in our own life so we profit off of dollars that move in and out of our hands yep um all right, so the last one um, that I'm just going to raise questions about and challenge today is um, very much in the realm of what we do, but uh, has to do with term life insurance. And, you know, I we are huge believers in life insurance in general, but term insurance itself is just purely an expense. Um, it has its place and they're definitely, you know, if you don't have any insurance at all, have something. Um, but because why, because your life is worth something. And if you weren't here, there would be an economic impact on your family and the people that love you as a result of you not being around. But as just that in and of itself doesn't solve all the problems because it is a pure expense. Um, term insurance itself is very inexpensive because great news, there's a 98% chance that you will not, uh, expire during that time period. So term just simply means a short term period five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. And insurance companies know that there's a 98% chance that you will still be around at the end of that insurance term. So um, in that regard, it just becomes another expense on your um, monthly budget. 
So all of this, the bottom of all of this is just simply what is the value of a dollar that you don't actually have access to? So if we are siphoning our money off into all of these different places, what is the value? What could you be doing with that money? What could you be doing with your retirement money? If you learned how to think, actually at the end of this, more like a banker. So bankers know that the big money is made in the flow of the money and it's keeping money moving from one place to another. And that's what we really specialize in educating people on is how to reevaluate their finances and simply redirect the flow. Um, I've heard it described more as like a, a stop along the, the train station. So everybody knows um, how to use the credit card. You know, uh, you pull out the card, you swipe it, and um, we're no longer paying um, the ice cream store directly for that ice cream scoop. And so the credit card company is going to pay the ice cream scoop. Well, why? What do we get while we're using our credit card? We get all these extra bonuses. We get airline miles. We get cash back. We get um, a delay on that payment um, if you're playing the game. And if you're paying it off and using the card the way it's intended to be used, then um, you get all those bonuses and just get to kind of kick the can down a little longer. Well, um, that's simply interrupting the flow of the money. And so you're paying the credit card company to pay the ice cream store for your ice cream scoop. But um, in the meantime, again, if you're not acquiring credit card debt, then you, you pick up a bunch of benefits along the line. Well, if we are starting to redirect the flow of your money and your finances, then um, you're going to be picking up some of those extra benefits yourself while the flow, the, the end result still ends up being the same, but you're collecting other benefits along the way. So um, <clears throat> there's a really amazing um, documentary out there that I highly, highly recommend. Um, it's called it's called The Power of Zero. And um, you can rent it on YouTube if you go to, um, and maybe we can pop it in the chat, just a link to this, uh, this documentary. This is, again, is going to challenge some of our thinking. Um, the, at the end of what this uh, documentary is about, it's exploring um, the problem that is coming to us as American citizens regarding our national debt. And it's the first time that I've actually better understood personally why our national debt is such a problem. You know, it's a big number. It's, it's, it's like incomprehensible how massive our national debt is. But there is a problem with that because it's going, we have to rectify the problem. Or there's big implications, not just to us, but for our, our uh, um, the next several generations and for the future and, and the security of our country. And really the only way to rectify that problem is to increase taxes. It has to happen. And the first place it's going to go is probably on those retirement accounts where we are deferring our taxes and, and saving that money for the future. Well, if the future means actually um, there's some interesting stuff in there, but the high, the highest interest, sorry, the highest tax rate that was ever in the U.S., I think was in the 1920s. Um, and it was something like up into the 90 percent, which is like you can't you can't live off of 90, 10 percent of your income. Um so anyway, it's just saying it's highlighting the tax problem that's coming. But this guy, Ed Slot, in that said that the single biggest benefit in the U.S. tax code and the most unused is the income tax exemption on whole life insurance. So, um, yep, I just said it. I said part of the solution is not your grandparents' whole life insurance. Let's just go ahead and get clear the air on that one. Um, and I say that tongue in cheek because my grandfather actually sold life insurance, which I didn't realize. Um, but this is not traditional life insurance. And so we need to rethink our thinking on things that we've been told. All of our, our strong, amazing, um, diligent Dave Ramsey folks out there and Susie Osmond of like buy term insurance and invest the difference. Um, we're going to challenge the thinking on some of that um, because there are massive benefits and implications to knowing how to do this right. But it has to be done right. So um, let's see here. So knowing that, let's look at what banks are actually doing with the money we put on deposit. And this is not a secret, by the way. You can go look up any one of these banks' annual reports. In fact, we'll have updated numbers. And if you all attend our event in February, um, we will actually have updated numbers on how much life insurance these, these banks actually own because their, their annual reports are coming out from last year. Um, but... This is, um, I like to pick on Wells Fargo, that they, the top asset class, tier one asset of how banks, we are a safe place to store your money, life insurance. 
And it's, again, it's not even hidden. You just have to know where to dig on their actual annual report and how to go in there and see what's in there. But it's not just life insurance, it's cash value life insurance. And that's really important. So these are some kind of key words here that we're gonna talk about. Um, so cash value just means um, money that you have access to. Think of it as a savings account. And so all of these banks are taking the money you put on deposit and buying life insurance with it. But what they're doing, they might, they might take out a, a life insurance policy. Let's say you wanna get a job at Wells Fargo. You join the company. They say, yeah, you're going to be an amazing employee. We're going to do something called bank-owned life insurance. Well, we own the policy, but you get the death benefit or some of it if you pass away. What they're not telling you is that, number one, your family will not receive all that the bank gets when you eventually graduate, expire, whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, if you stop working for the bank, they continue to own that life insurance. So it's called BOLI, bank-owned life insurance, B-O-L-I. And um, it is a thing, y'all. It is a big thing. And it is a very massive industry. Um, <clears throat> and the most secure way that banks are actually um, staying alive. Um, there was something else I read recently. Again, I have to, with our licensing, we have to do a lot of continuing ed. And I actually learned that during the Great Depression, um, <clears throat> it was not our government that was helping the banks out. It was actually the life insurance companies, uh, the insurance companies across America that bailed out the banks and saved, basically saved the core of our country during the Great Depression. And I just thought that was really interesting that that's a little known fact that we just think like, oh, our country eventually, you know, World War II started and we were able to kind of claw our way out of this massive economic depression. But it was actually the life insurance companies that were coming in and making the banks solvent again. <clears throat> All right, so what else? What else do you want to learn? Well, all of these companies are actually implementing it. Um, so, and they all have kind of a cool story behind getting up and running. So Walt Disney, he was unable to um, get a loan to start this silly little magical land for kids in the middle of a swamp. And so uh, he borrowed from his life insurance company from his policy that he owned. He, he took the cash value out of that and that is what got him the startup capital in order to start this wild idea that he had. And I know that Ray Croft, with, uh, when he bought McDonald's, he wanted to start this campaign to get little kids to buy hamburgers with a silly looking clown with red hair and um, needed some capital for that. And so he too borrowed from his life insurance company. Um, so all of these co companies kind of have an interesting origin story regarding the things that we are teaching our clients to do. Um, all right, who knows else knows about this? So all of these uh, leaders, we, we won't call them all great. We'll just call them leaders. <laughs> you can pick which one you don't like or like. Uh, we know that Joe Biden, when he had to disclose his finances the first time he ran for office with Obama, that he had uh, zero, zero folks, zero investments, and he had six life insurance policies. And guess what? He didn't need to disclose the cash value or how much cash he had inside of those life insurance policies. So we don't know. We don't actually know what his finances look like. Um, I'm very curious. I haven't personally dug into the recent tax return reports on old Trumpel, um, but <laughs> Trumpel Stilkskin, <laughs> um, but I have a feeling he too, we know that he has life insurance. We know he has whole life insurance, but um, it's one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't, where, you know, again, you don't have to disclose how much is inside your life insurance policy. So people will criticize him for not having enough, or if he has too much, he'll get criticized for that too. So that was probably a significant reason why he doesn't want to disclose everything that's in there. Um, so uh, that, at least 54 of our current elected officials and ev every Fortune 500 company is implementing what we teach our clients to do. So, um, and this is just kind of the last slide and I'd love to open it up for, um, for questions as well. Um, but the, I want to just dive briefly into the ways we've been told to, to think about money. Um, and really, um, we think that there are three different types of people regarding finances. There are probably more, but we're going to simplify it. Um, but uh, the first one is just very simply what probably 70% of Americans do with their money, which is if you need a new car, you go to the car lot, you pick out the shiniest, fanciest, fastest new car that you want, and you go into the office and they set you up with an amazing loan or not so amazing loan. Um, 
And what your goal is, is to chip away at that debt. Chip away, chip away, chip away. Ugh, finally, you pay it off. But by the time you pay it off, guess what? You probably need a new car. So you go pick one out again and then just chip away, chip away, chip away. And the whole point of the game is to get back to nothing, which doesn't sound like a winning strategy. Uh, the alternative that we've been presented with is the um, don't go into debt. Debt is bad. You're a real estate investor. So I know you're willing to think up by the box on that, but debt is bad. So what do you do? You save. We say we are strong savers and savers will save us. And so what we do is we save up, save up, save up, save up. We take the bus, we walk, we do whatever we need to. We don't go into debt and be enslaved to somebody else. And we drain that savings all the way back down, apart from your emergency savings and your three months, whatever, um, all the way back to what? To zero. And you're going to need a new car eventually. So what do you have to do? You have to save up again and you have to start this process over. Save up, save up, save up. And then, oh, you pick it out and you go pick out that new car and pay cash, pay cash for all the things. And so this isn't essentially a winning strategy either, because at the end of the day, and again, we we love and we love to challenge our Dave Ramsey folks of, um, of the savers, because there's some beautiful, beautiful strategies in that and some long-term options that I think are really helpful um, for getting people out of debt. There's good debt and there's bad debt. But what we're trying to do is show folks that there is a different way because at the end of the day, the game isn't to end with nothing. We want to pass something on. And what we hope to pass on is what we all wish we had received to start our real estate investment careers, which is a load of cash in order to get going or to learn how to steward finances. So in that, again, we teach people how to kind of deconstruct what they've been taught about finances and to rethink the flow of that money. And in that, we're going to teach you how to be a wealth creator. So wealth creators know that there's a cost. There's a cost to everything. There's an initial cost to get going. But if it's a smart investment, if it is a smart opportunity, you will not only recover your initial cost to get going, but that money will start to make money for you indefinitely. And this is where a lot of folks are like, literally until the day you die, literally until the day you die. So we set systems up for folks that will be reimbursed. So we'll set up a retirement plan for someone and they're going to use that retirement plan. They're going to live off of that money, hopefully not working at all, just enjoying family and life and the world. And when they eventually expire or graduate or pass away, all of that retirement, number one, is reimbursed and the leftover is passed on to the next generation to hopefully step and repeat this process. And so you're never having to give up. You're, the game here is not getting back to zero. The game is learn how to steward your finances really well and learn how to teach that to the next generation. So I don't know if many of you are familiar with um, the phrase three generations from, oh, correct me, Jack, if I'm going to get this wrong, three generations from uh, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. And so that's saying like basically this generation that rolls up their sleeves digs in, goes to the daily grind, the American dream. You know, if you can dream it, you can do it. Work really hard, pass that on so that the next generation doesn't have to do what you did to get to where you are. So the next generation has a leap ahead and they can be the doctors, the nurses, the, the lawyers, the, the better education. And then their kids could be the artists or whatever else beyond that. But then what happens with that fourth generation is that that wisdom and that work ethic usually stops. So what we also want to try to be thinking about here are what are those what are those tools that we want to pass on to the next generation that are more than important than just how to make wealth? How do you keep it and retain it? And part of this is implementing systems that, I mean, everyone here should be familiar with the Rockefellers. They are still a financial powerhouse. And there's a free PDF book out there called, uh, I think it's What the Rockefellers Know or Do What the Rockefellers Did. And that is setting up generational family banking systems and wealth creation systems to pass along, but with restrictions and tools on how to use that money. So the Rockefellers start life insurance policies on every baby born into the family. And you have access to that family trust and that pool of money, but for two things, to start a business or for your education. But what the, the promise is that you are going to go out and you're going to contribute to society and you're going to do something and you're going to work hard. And you're going to learn how to steward it. But we can help you in these two areas. If you want to start a business or if you want an education or both, you have access to that family funding in that. 
Um, I do have several wealthy clients that really kind of sweat over this. So like, you know, I've, I've worked really hard and I understand this money really well, but I don't want to ruin my kids by passing it on. I saw an article on BBC the other day of most um, wealthy uh, supermodels and uh, actors and whatnot don't want to pass on their wealth to the next generation because they don't want to ruin them. They don't want them to be overwhelmed by this finances. But I think that within this, there's actually something that we're missing at the core which is just about that stewardship. And if it's something that we can understand and wrap our brains around, this isn't just a sit back and kick back and relax. How many people are in retirement, get bored and go out and get jobs, right? Because you want to be producing something with your in your life. There's something innate in human nature that drives us towards creating something and passing something along. So Anyway, all of this is just an invitation to start exploring a lot of this information and to explore to some of the, again, some of those things we've been taught about our finances, about our retirement funds, um, and, and it's never too late to start. I just want to emphasize that, that I have a lot of clients that I meet with and they, they pre-disqualify themselves from an opportunity. Um, Jack and I have been in this for a really long time. And Jason, I think he's on Facebook joining us, but we've been in this for a long time and it's our job. And we are pulling together about 50 different elements as we get to know someone and designing a strategy for them that doesn't work just for today. Like that's the losing strategy. It doesn't work for just a year. We're planning for 10, 20, 50 years out and planning on how are we going to help people accomplish their, their medium and long-term goals um, that this isn't a get rich quick strategy. I mean, none of the folks that I mean, are the wealthiest families in the country, it didn't happen overnight, but it's part of that due diligence and that learning to implement systems that are, that are tried and true. Um, and, and again, just learning to think like the wealthy and not just think like them, but also operate like them and to use our finances the way they do. So I'm going to go ahead and end it there so that we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, if anyone has any questions for Olivia or Jack, let's go for it. Got to... All right, we have something online from Heather. Would it be possible to leverage a HELOC and run it through a properly structured life insurance policy to fund real estate investments? Yeah, um, possibly. So again, a lot of what we're doing when we're strategizing with our clients is looking at numbers, running numbers and opportunities. But what we don't want to do is bite off more than we can chew. So it is an opportunity. It is a way that we have had clients get started in that way. Um, but we want to be really intentional. So we don't want to take loans without thinking about provisions or thinking about how, how that money is going to be multiplied down the line. So um, that, again, that is something that we can explore. And we would love, um, Heather, if you want to set up a meeting with Jack or Jason or I um, on the Asria website. I don't know if we can, Jack, if you can pull up or something, the, the link to our website where they can book a meeting with us. Um, but we could definitely, um, definitely explore that opportunity. Awesome. So, so is there any examples you can maybe share with us? Um, and Molly, let us know if there's any questions on Facebook or anything um, as well. Um, yeah, any any examples for real estate investors that maybe you could share with us? Any past clients? Any cool stories? Yeah. You can give us uh, some ideas about. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's see here. So, I, I mean, I always feel more comfortable sharing my own experience because <laughs> I feel like I have yeah. a uh, yeah. So, my husband and I started our first policy when our first daughter was born. And um, it felt like a real financial stretch of just, this is taking part of that tax return that we had loaned Uncle Sam and changing a few other things in our finances. We landed on some numbers that we felt comfortable with, um, but also knew it would be a challenge. And so we had our policy for about a year and a half and Colorado Winters needed a new vehicle, went and picked out a new car. Um, and two weeks later found out we owed Uncle Sam more then we made our first year of marriage, which was highly embarrassing and very scary. And so we didn't make any car payments. We were the bankers. Uh, we had just paid cash essentially for our car using our, our whole life insurance policy set up a specific way. And we were about to start making regular car payments back to, to establish that. 
So um, that wasn't going to be possible. Now, two miracles happened. Number one was that the tax deadline moved for the first time in his history without penalties. Um, mm -hmm. This was in 2020. So it moved from April to July. And then number two is that we had less than half of what we thought we did. So we had all the money saved, ready to go, ready to pay the tax deadline when we needed to. Um, but then, so we eventually started paying that loan back. And just this last year, we've actually drained all that we had built back up again. Um, but loan number two this time, so we haven't even paid back loan number one, but we've already used loan number two to buy our first real estate investment. And when it's not like we paid cash for that real estate investment, we actually had some pretty creative financing, um, involved, involving HELOCs, involving some other stuff. Um, but, uh, we were able to buy our first real estate investment and put the down payment on that by draining our policy again. So loan number two is going to be paid back by our real estate investment. And so again, it's just kind of establishing, think of it as your retirement account or any other place where you have a pool of money, but you're able to have a lot of quick access to it and using that. And so it's kind of one bit, one loan, but it's being paid back by three or four systems or three or four real estate investment. Um, so another, let's see, I don't know, Jack, if you have another example. Um, we have several clients that just, um, they, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, on a larger scale, unbridled, there's there's 28 unbridled companies, and our founder runs a lot of uh, retained earnings through these policies. And he bought eight different historic buildings in Canyon City, Colorado, on auction um, with policy loans at first. Uh, yeah, they were great deals because they were pretty old buildings, including a really cool historic hotel. Um, but after that, um, and after kind of making plans for how to update and restore them, um, they basically just refinanced, uh, the loans or the properties with the bank paid off the policy loans. And there's a lot of different businesses that are, um, already operate out of those buildings that are, yeah, kind of paying back, um, unbridled for, rent money and, and otherwise. So, um, yeah, yeah, essentially like you're, you're creating your own pool of capital that will grow for you the rest of your life, no matter what, whether you have money loaned out or not. Um, and yeah, and then borrowing against that along the way to invest in different opportunities or, uh, make a major purchase. So yeah, it's a, it's a, a pretty cool system just in terms of we talked about uninterrupted compounding really similar to a HELOC like if you have equity built up you can ask that access that via a bank loan and that doesn't affect your property appreciating or depreciating with with the market it's going to continue growing whether you own a hundred percent of it or zero percent of it so in the same way that's how your cash value grows but just on a guaranteed basis plus a dividend each year so yeah that's kind of cool kind of how it works yeah i'm using a policy loan for a uh, short-term rental that i i just launched and first profits from that will pay back the loan and kind of replenish the cash value so love it so so we're winding down here so if you have any questions feel free to pop in uh would you like to let us know what's going on and what you're going to talk about february 3rd and february 4th and uh just kind of give us some insight what, what we're doing totally yeah so uh tuesday or no, uh, in, in tucson friday friday, friday, friday. <laughs> friday evening 5 30 to 8 30 um we'll provide um sandwiches for dinner and just talk through the strategy in more depth some of the mechanics of um permanent life insurance policies and how we're uniquely structuring them to fit a person's situation so that they can serve as a banking system for them and a lot more. Um, yeah, we'll actually hopefully have uh, a Tucson couple who are clients share about their experience with their policy and how they've already used it for policy loans on a couple different investments. Um, and then Phoenix will be the same thing, but a little more time because it's, um, yeah, 10 to 2 on that Saturday morning. So, yeah, the three of us will all be there kind of walking through the why, the how, and then, yeah, how you can kind of apply and, and get this started. 
um, based on your unique situation. <clears throat> Anything awesome. to add to that, Olivia? Yeah, just that um, we we hope to see a lot of you there in person that we're going to dive. I mean, again, a lot of this, we were vague intentionally today, but when we dive into this, we will teach you all of the mechanics of how and why this works as well as go over what are some of those risks and what are some of the things that we've seen where this hasn't worked out for someone. Um, and here's a little hint, by and large, it has to do with not uh, doing it with a specialist. So um, this is our specialty. Um, unashamedly, this is what, you know, we're using it ourselves. Um, and we're going to give you more of those examples of how we've used it and what those deals have looked like, but then also um, how it can apply to you. Everyone's situation is unique. This is not a, hey, a minimum buy-in of X, Y, or Z. Um, this is literally, we are tailoring everyone's strategy to their specific situation, to their goals, um, and figuring out what works well with them. And this also isn't a system of, hey, you know, we set it up and we hope it works in year two. It's more of a, like, we're mapping the numbers out. We're letting the numbers tell us and inform us on how to put this together in a really smart way. Um, and it's fun when people are up and running with it and to see the opportunities that come become available because they've already implemented a system and, um, and they're thinking outside that box and they're looking for those other opportunities and they can, uh, they can tailor a deal even to fit within their banking system. So, or allow, allow their banking system to fit inside the deal that they want to have. Um, because you're the banker. And so you kind of get to dictate the terms of what that loan repayment looks like, how that fits with your finances, and and to make sure, you know, that if um, if you buy a rental property and all of a sudden there's a moratorium on rent and people aren't paying back their loan or paying back their, their rent, but you're obliged to a mortgage still, if you're the banker, you have a lot of flexibility on that. So we're going to teach you what that looks like and, and why the system has been around for 150 years and is still continuing to be a financial, um, it's kind of, I call it like a financial operating system in the background that's holding together major financial institutions. Love it. So if any last questions as we, we wrap up, um, the links are in the chat to register for uh, the third and the fourth, or you could always go to azria.org forward slash calendar to sign up. Um, yeah, I think we're good. If there's no other questions. Awesome. I want to thank yeah. you for being here and not another Lunch and Learn once again. Um, also, Unbridled Wealth is on our uh, podcast. So they're on the Azria show. So if you want to get a little bit more information about them and learn about them individually, because you also have a partner, Jason, who's not here. A uh, wonderful yeah. gentleman here. Where is he today? Um, Let's see. With the time, I don't know if it's school drop-off <laughs> time or what. Oh, family. <laughs> different time zones and all the different things. But I know he was awesome. joining us just remotely. So, cool. yeah. Well, Jason, hello if you're out there. Um, we'll see you guys in a couple weeks. I'm excited to hang out with you guys. So, um, otherwise, the, we're good. Everyone All right. Good Thanks day. so much. Awesome. Thank Everybody. you. All right. Thanks for joining us.